for me, one of the most interesting things to think about is how we went from small, insignificant primates on the savannas of Africa to modern civilization. So in other words, how we went from this to this. So commonly when we think about this, we think it was technological innovations, things like the invention of the printing press or the steam engine or the industrial revolution. But social psychologist Jonathan Hyatt actually argues that it was psychological innovations rather than technological innovations that got us to where we are. So in this short video, I'm just going to go through three of these psychological innovations that can sort of help explain how human beings kind of rose to the top of the food chain and built modern civilization. A good way to start thinking about this question is to look at the difference between human beings and other primates. Like what separates us, us from chimpanzees, for example? So we know that about six million years ago, humans and chimps had the same common ancestor. We had the same DNA, we had the same brains, we had the same opportunity and the same threats. So why have human beings gone on to explore outer space, conduct scientific experiments and do all these incredible things while chimpanzees are, well, they're still, they're still chimps really. In 2007, there was an experiment carried out by a man called Michael, Tom Michael Tomasello and a few others. And the experiment basically compared compare the intelligence of chimpanzees, orangutans and human children who were about two and a half years old. So half of the tasks were physical and that meant using using tools and just basic problem solving uh, yeah basic problem solving and then half of the tasks were social so this these involved actually reading the intentions and social signals of the experimenter so let's say there's two cups and underneath one of the cup there is a reward the experimenter would point at the cup that had the reward underneath it and it was the job of the kid or the the chimpanzee or the orangutan to use that signal to pick the right cup so in the physical tasks interestingly the human kids and the chimpanzees scored almost evenly actually pretty much pretty much even and then the orangutans were a little bit behind what's interesting is that in the social tasks the human beings completely dominated and these were the these were the tasks where you had to read the intention of, of the experimenter. So they had to be able to know what actually pointing meant. And they had to be able to sort of follow the experimenter's eyes and intentions. So why is this important? Well, basically shared intentionality, this ability to share our intention with, share our intentions with others and read social, social signals was the initial spark that first got us cooperating together because this meant that for the first time ever in our evolutionary history, we could work on the same goals together. So before that, say we had to move a heavy rock, we could only really do that by ourselves. But now we could work in, work in a group to achieve that goal together. And this meant for the first time that we could, we could um, have cooperative hunting, we could have cooperative rearing, we could have cooperative foraging, and we could have a division of labor for the first time. So this psychological innovation of being able to share our intentions with others and work on the same goals together, this is really the thing that, that got the ball rolling in terms of getting us going towards um, working in bigger groups and eventually forming, forming societies. When you look at this image, what difference do you notice between the human eyes and the eyes of the, the monkeys? If you take a second to look, you can see that humans are the only primate that have whites in their eyes. And crucially, this actually gives information away. So the whites in our eyes enable other people to see what we're looking at. They can see what our eyeballs are focused on. But you can't really do that with chimpanzee eyes or gorilla eyes or bonobo eyes. So we can see that for an individual species in an environment with scarce resources, this would be a disadvantage. And an example uh, Jonathan Hyatt actually uses is, is that say if you're a chimpanzee and you see a banana tree and you look at the banana tree, and then somebody else sees you looking at the banana, banana tree, then there's a good chance they might get the food instead of you and there might be none left for you. So that would be a disadvantage if somebody else could see what you were looking at um, if you were a chimpanzee. However, for some reason, humans have evolved this ability. Like we, it's, 
And this suggests that at some point in our evolutionary past, it became advantageous for others to know what our intentions were, what we were looking at, what we were paying attention to. So this is just, this sort of shows how even our biology is geared towards shared intentionality and sort of it helps explain how, um, why this is such a big part of human nature, in other words. So really, shared intentionality was the lead domino that eventually led to language, led to cooperative hunting and foraging, and led to a division of labor. So now for the first time, we were cooperating groups together and we had a division of labor. But anytime you've got a division of labor, you've got also got something called a free rider problem. And this basically means that some people in the group are going to try and take advantage of the hard work of others. They're going to sit back, relax and chill and let everybody else do the hard work while they just get to enjoy the benefits. So for, for us to evolve as a cooperative species, we needed to figure out a way, we needed to figure out a solution to this free rider problem. We needed to figure a way, a, a way to motivate and reward selfless behavior and punish and de-incentivize selfish behavior. We needed to make it dangerous to be a slacker. So evolutionary theorists argue that this helps to explain the evolution of human morals. They were essentially a way that we were able to police ourselves before, before we had any police forces. This helps explain why we're fascinated with things that involve moral outrage. Like think about the last time that somebody told you a very juicy bit of gossip. Like how did that make you feel? Like, did you want to tell somebody else about it? Um, we find things that involve moral outrage extremely interesting and extremely exciting because it was evolutionary advantageous for us to do so. And this is why we, we love watching things like soap operas, like EastEnders and Coronation Street, because they tap into this, this amazing or this intense interest we have for things that involve moral outrage. A good way to illustrate this is to think about an early human tribe that had to go out every day in search of new food. So let's say the men had to go out and hunt some animals and bring back some meat for dinner that evening. And the woman had to go foraging, sorry, had to go foraging for fruits, nuts, seeds berries, these kinds of things. And they would all bring back the food at night and they would enjoy a meal together around a fire. But now, let's say there's one member of that tribe that never does any work, um, never goes out in the hunts, never, he just stays in the shelter all day and chills. Do you think that the other group members would like this person? Do you think he'd be likely to pass his genes on to the next generation? Or do you not think it's more likely that they would just get rid of him, maybe even kill him? I would say probably the latter is, is, is more so. So we can see that in our evolutionary past, it, it was you were far more likely to survive if you were a team player because we evolved this, this sense of morality and we evolved this motivation to be a team player and we evolved these emotions that basically make us want to punish people that we see as free riders or or as slackers. So that helps to explain how, how human morals evolved, and how they actually made us more effective team players. So, so far we've looked at how shared intentionality was the initial, the initial thing that got the ball rolling with, with human cooperation. This is the thing that enabled us to work on shared goals together. Then we can see then that how morals enabled individuals to be more effective team players and motivated us to do so, but also de-incentivized de us to be slackers and free riders. So what was the final step? How do we take these small groups of uh, hunters and foragers and turn them into these giant societies and civilizations that we, that we see today? Like what was the final step? The final piece in the puzzle was something known as the psychology of sacredness. Now, universally, human beings have a tendency to elevate certain objects, people, and places to the status of sacred. If you're religious, it might be a holy book, such as the Bible or the Quran. If you're a humanist, it could be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or a 
cultural icons such as Martin Luther King or Gandhi. And if you're patriotic, it could be your country's flag or a national anthem. Sacredness is powerful because it has the ability to create shared belief systems, common identities, and importantly, it we are willing to sacrifice our own self-interest for things that we consider sacred. So think how many people died during World War I and World War II because of something that was sacred to them, whether it was the ideal of freedom or democracy or their, their country. You know, these are sacred things and people are literally willing to sacrifice their life and their existence for things that they consider sacred. So we can see that sacred objects and people and places have this incredible power to motivate human behavior and to, to get us to cooperate together in large groups. In the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari, he makes the argument that human beings' ability to imagine things that weren't actually real and then communicate them with others is something that helped us to cooperate in larger groups for the first time. So these, this was the ability to actually, you know, think of something or imagine something and believe in something that wasn't actually part of the physical reality, like something you couldn't knock on, not something like a rock or uh, a tree or a river, like things that didn't actually exist. At some point in our past, we were able to come up with these fictions in our brains and then communicate these with other people. So as an example to illustrate this, think about, let's say I'm a human uh, 50,000 years ago, and all of a sudden I can start to believe that there is a specific oak tree in the forest that is supernatural and it's communicating with me and it's telling me to do certain things. Now, if I can go back and I can convince 30 members of my tribe that this oak tree is supernatural and is communicating with me then our group is more likely to cooperate more effectively together because we cooperate more effectively with people that believe the same things that we do but this is important because now if i can convince a neighboring tribe of 30 people who also see that tree regularly that that tree is supernatural and is telling me to me to do things and communicate these things then all of a sudden that 30 that group of 30 people also believes that the, the tree is supernatural and all of a sudden you have two groups of 30 that believe the same thing and because we're far more likely to cooperate with people that believe the same things that we do and we trust those people more that meant that the two groups of 30 now had the potential to cooperate for the first time as a group of 60. So you do that enough and you could eventually get things like organized religion starting to form. You eventually get things like bigger groups. And ultimately, Harari argues that this is what has enabled us to create things like corporations, um, to create things like money. It all starts from this ability to believe in these shared fictions and communicate them and get others to believe them too. So this ability to create sacred objects and believe in these shared fictions together meant that for the very first time, we were able to cooperate in, in much larger groups. So now we could cooperate with people that we didn't even know and could trust personally. We could cooperate with people that believe the same things we do. So this meant that our group sizes could go from, say, 30 people to 60 people to 150 people. All that was required was that we believe the same thing. So this meant that we could grow, grow our groups exponentially and this eventually could lead to, to these massive um, societies that we, that we live in today. So in conclusion, I think now we live in an era of hyper-individualism. We're becoming increasingly self-obsessed. Um, we judge our success by how many likes we have on Facebook, how many followers we have on Instagram, and how quickly we're ascending the, the corporate ladder. Um, but what, what researching this work has really made me realize is that the, th the fundamental thing that makes us human beings is our ability to cooperate with others, our ability to be effective team players. This is what separates us from primates. 
this is what it, this is what has got us to the top of the food chain. This is what has made all of our technological innovation possible. This is the, at the very core of, of being being human. So my big takeaway has been that you know if we want to improve ourselves both individually and collectively, like I think the thing to focus on is probably on improving our ability to cooperate with others, improving our ability to be an effective team player. Because when you can do that, I think it just gives you a lot more options in life and increases your your potential in, in huge ways. And I find myself, it's just, anytime I'm working in a team towards something, it's just, it's so satisfying. It's just feels very intrinsically motivating. So in conclusion, the three psychological innovations that have kind of, got us to where we are today and the things that separate us from other primates are shared intentionality so this is the ability to share intentions with others and work on the same goals together um, human morality which basically motivated us and incentivized us to be effective team players and de-incentivize us to be to be selfish and the psychology of sacredness which meant for the first time ever we could start combining combining our small tribes into larger tribes and forming these bigger groups, which eventually led to things like organized religion. It led to the invention of uh, money and, and all these different things that we use to organize our societies. So that's just some ideas. I really I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. I highly recommend checking out Jonathan Hyatt's book, The Righteous Mind, where he goes into these ideas in more depth and just covers how how important human morality is in, ex in understanding human nature itself so it's, it's fascinating stuff and thanks for listening